Good morning. Okay, good to be with you. So, today we are looking at chapter 14 in the Gospel of Mark. You know, our last session and the last time we were speaking, we were talking about the things such as the end of the world, the predictions made by Jesus, right, um, of the end times. And we noted that we see a lot of parallels today. And so the Lord exhorts us. We see the parallels today, but th there are people who've seen the parallels in other times in history as well. I told you that there, when it is really the time, my understanding would be that these things would be coming in more rapid succession, one after the other, not just a war here or an earthquake here, but often, all the time, all of this. There would be mayhem, chaos, great falling away from the churches, hatred for Christianity where there's persecution again. Um, chaos in the streets and everywhere. And so that's why we kind of looked at it and said, wow, we're seeing a little bit of that today. Other times in history did as well. But the one exhortation that Jesus said to us is, you know, you don't know when he's coming. And you don't know whether he's coming in the morning, in the evening, at all. He said, so don't, don't be sleeping when he's coming. And what I say to you, I say unto all, watch. Watch for my coming. <clears throat> That's what the Lord's exhortation is to us. So now we're looking at chapter 14, and it's really going to be discussing the plot to kill Jesus, right? Now we're coming toward the Passover, toward the crucifixion. Even though he's been telling them about it the whole time. They haven't quite grasped what he's really saying. So we're going to jump into chapter 14 of the Gospel of Mark, beginning at chapter 1. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for another day that we might sit in, at your feet and learn from you, your holy word. Prepare our hearts even now that we might receive your word in the spirit of love and joy. And Lord, that your word would be effectual in our lives and in the lives of all those who cross our paths. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. So they've got the Feast of the Passover coming. Unleavened Bread. And already... They're planning on how to take Jesus by trickery, deception, a lie. They just want to get rid of him. They don't want him there. They don't want anything about him there. Uh, and especially during the feast because they fear the people. And they don't want the people to, to get in a big uproar that, you know, they've taken our Lord. So verse 3, and being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. And then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves. And he said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me. 
for you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She's come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Wow. So there were those there who were indignant when they saw her do what they felt was a, a waste of the very expensive oil. Spike nard, right? Well, if they could have gotten 300 denarii and given it to the poor, they're thinking, instead she wastes it. And Jesus said, let her alone. Isn't it interesting how some people value things, right? Oscar Wilde once said, the cynic knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. Think about that statement. The cynic knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. Here we see the value of what she did, which is what Jesus said. She's done a good work for me. You have the poor which you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you don't have always. What she has done, she, she has done what she could. It's all she had, right? She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Again, tells them, prophesying to them that he's going to die. He's going to be killed. Surely I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in all the world, that this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and they promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Everybody's trying to betray Jesus now, right? So here you have, you know, Judas Iscariot, one of the 12. You already are told that the, that the, the scribes, right? The Pharisees, the chief priests and scribes sought how they might take Jesus by trickery and put him to death. And, you know, their, their ideas and thoughts and hopes were answered when Judas walked into them. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, he's the one who went to the chief priests to betray Jesus. And when they heard it, they were glad, like, yes, finally somebody's come. And they promised to give him money. So he saw to you how he might conveniently betray him. So now there's plotting going on in Judas's heart. How might he conveniently betray Jesus because he wants money? Boy, the things people will do for money. Think about that. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he said, and he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is the great room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. So it's like he's prophesying all of these things that are going to be there. And he sends his two disciples. So his disciples went out, verse 16. And as he had said to them, they prepared the Passover. 
In the evening he came with the twelve. Now as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. Think about that. Now he's accusing one of the ones sitting and eating with him. And they began to be sorrowful, I bet. And they began to say to him one by one, Is it me? Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and he said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. What a powerful statement. So Jesus is already prophesying and saying, look, there's 12 sitting in the upper room. And Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. One of you who is going to dip your bread in the dish with me will betray me. And they all started talking, and Lord, who, me? Are you talking about me? Peter says, me? John says, Lord, is it I? Notice Judas didn't say anything. But Jesus prophesies, says, the Son of Man indeed goes, just as it written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Now you know Judas sitting there listening to this. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. You would think Judas would have given up turning on him at that point. But no. No. And as they were eating, <clears throat> Jesus took bread he blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said take eat this is my body and then he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it he gave it to them and they all drank from it and he said to them this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many Assuredly, I say to you, I will, in no, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So this passage itself is a, a training For the Lord's Supper, at least for future generations of Christians. But here's where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Surely I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. This is what the enemy does. He always goes after the pastor, the bishop, the teacher. If he can strike the shepherd, the sheep are confused. They don't know where to go. Verse 27. I mean verse 28. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. So he's talking about his 
death, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Verse 29, Peter said to him, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. Now he's showing his full omniscience, his all-knowing. Which proves he's Messiah. But it's hard for others to believe. Verse 31, but he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. <laughs> Isn't it funny how everybody stands up with you in sentiment until it costs them something. Until people come with swords or guns or knives or whatever it might be and say, break it up or you all die. And you'll see those who really stick around and those who leave. Well, verse 32 is about the prayer in the garden. After this, they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here for a while while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little further and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Then he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and he prayed and he spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them sleeping again, for their eyes were heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being trapped into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, confronting him. Now his betrayer had given him a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. So it's one thing for Christ to be arrested. It's another thing to be betrayed based on a lie. These are truly horrible signs. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid their hands on the human then they laid their hands on him and took him. 
Then one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant in the right ear and, ear and cut off his ear. Interesting story. And then there answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to make me? I today therefore, therefore, with you in the temple teaching, you did not seize me, but the scripture must also be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him. A young man runs away fleeing naked, apparently. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man had hold, laid hold of him. And the health, and he left the linen cloth and fled from his, them who are marked. Jesus, and they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were embarrassments by the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at their fire. Now the, the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. They're looking for testimony. Anybody who can say they saw him do something wrong, there was none. They trumped those charges up. So, the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none, none, and then this man came. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I'll build it up without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high, the high priest asked, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? You know, Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Passover and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes. He said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. You know, they began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officer struck him with the palms of their hands. Now, as Peter was slowing, was, was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when he saw, when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You are with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know you nor forsake you. What you are... And he went out, on, nor understand what you were saying. And he went out on the porch where a scooter crowed. And the servant girl saw him and tamed in him. 
to those who stood by. This is one of them. So they're already pointing him out, right? Saying, you're one of them. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. The second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the words Jesus were valid. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. I think for us, the betrayal of Jesus, circumstances are not right to do it yet. Hopefully you never do it. But there are things we need to look at and talk about. We, there are slave labor that were used all over the world, Aborigine people everywhere. So we're dealing with a very complicated book. Excuse me. A very complicated book. And in this book, what we're seeing is all of the facets of church history and so forth, all condensed in Mark and his snippets on his journey in the gospel. You know, so the next step, now that they have said all these things, the next step for Mark to do is to confront the other disciples, and he's writing down about Jesus seeing the face of Pilate, even God the Father on the mountain. It's all here. 15, it says, immediately in the morning, the chief priests heard, ha held a council with the elders and described in the whole council that they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. And when Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He managed and said, yes, I am he. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered them not. So now we're getting into the accusations, the lies, everything in order to crucify Jesus. And you know, sometimes I think if we don't do what scripture says by setting our hearts on things above, not on things here on the earth, if we do not follow that, we're not going to make it through this type of persecution. And honestly, that's for most of us. This is something that we have to be desperately afraid of and diligently preparing for. Well, I think we're going to end it there today because I want to jump into chapter 15 on a different note for us. Read over chapter 14 once more. So get it in your mind, the goodness and grace of God's mercy. That's what he's showing you here, even among saints. And it's just a fabulous thing, especially when it's our Lord and Savior, who is the one who does everything that we see. So I ask that you would read ahead and especially read ahead chapter 15 and we will join you again tomorrow. Same time, same channel. Lord, grant us an easy evening, one of peace and serenity and one that continues to uphold you as the father of all created beings. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.